Um, you know, right now, we're going to continue right now what's going on, our It Is Written series. And you might go, what is this about? Well, actually, we've been reading through the Bible, chronological Bible. If you want one of these, you can grab one at the Welcome Center. Just pick up one on the way out the door. And you can pick up right where we're at. I mean, if you're like, okay, I've been putting it off, man, just pick up right here in August with us. And you can see, and so as we're reading through this, all of a sudden, I'll preach out of it. When someone will preach out, mostly it's times it's me. And here we are in Jeremiah. And I want to tell you something um, that you may have experienced if you've been married. And that is, when Rachel and I got married 21 years ago, all of a sudden, like right when we got married, people were asking us the question. You know what the question is, right? The question is, when are you going to have children? I'm like, well, give us at least 10 minutes. I mean, we just got married. This is ridiculous. I don't know. I mean, eventually we're going to have kids, I guess. And, and then our first year of marriage, we're in worship service, just like you got to have this worship experience. And I'm sitting around next to Rachel, standing up. And all of a sudden, I felt like something go down my arm. I looked over, and my wife had passed out right in the middle of worship service. That's how good it was, all right? And all of a sudden, she like, wakes back up, and then she heads out the door. And I go check on her. She was fine. But everyone in the church church found out about it. So you know what they started saying? She's pregnant. I'm like, no, she's not. She better not be. I mean, this is, we just, we just, we're not ready for this right now. And so when you're not ready for kids, what do you do? What do you do if you're not ready for kids? You buy a dog. That's right. You buy a dog. And so we got a yellow lab. I was going to get a yellow female lab. That's what I always wanted. And so I checked out all these litters and all of a sudden I found this one litter, beautiful puppies. I still remember just like it was yesterday. Out of that nine puppies, all of a sudden this yellow female comes right up to me. And it was that moment we bonded and we never left each other's side. I mean, we were just connected from then on out. And then, you know, having that puppy put off a couple of years, having our first, you know, our first baby. And then we had another baby and then we had another baby. And next thing you know it, you blink and your dog is getting older, right? I'm out of town, and, and, uh, and, and, and so I was, I, was, I was doing a wedding, I was speaking somewhere, I was leading a worship, all at the same, like over a 24-hour period, it was nuts, and during the madness of running around this other city, all of a sudden, I get a call from my wife, and she says, Jesse, that's my dog, she said, Jesse is not doing really well, I think I may have to put her down before you get home. And it was in that moment that I realized, I always... I always had planned that I would be there, you know, to do that. That was the plan. Like, I, if I'm going to have a dog, I'm going to do the hard thing, too. I want to be all the way to the end. And, and all of a sudden, in that moment, as I'm going down the road on, and an interstate and 2,000 miles away, I realize life doesn't go like you have it planned, right? Have you noticed? Raise your hand if you've noticed that life does not go as you had it planned. Raise your hand, all right? I think it goes for all of us. We had plans. I mean, if you lived longer than five years on this planet, you had plans, and they have not panned out like you thought they would pan out and it's just one of the realities of of life I thought some of you are thinking right now I thought I was supposed to be married by now some of you are thinking right now I thought I was supposed to get that promotion I was supposed to get retired by now I was supposed to be on this financial track by by now I was supposed to have accomplished this dream by now I was supposed to have children by now or <laughs> I was a not I was not supposed to get bankrupt I was not supposed to lose my job I wasn't supposed to get divorced. I wasn't supposed to get cancer. What do you do when life doesn't turn out the way you had it planned? And all of a sudden, here we come in our daily Bible reading to Jeremiah 29, verse 11. It's one of the most famous, popular verses of all the Bible, all right? And I've had people come up and say, this is my life verse. Like, this is the verse. And, and I want us to look at this verse together, and then we're going to look at more of the context of it. And so here it is in Jeremiah 29, 11. Here's what it says. For God says, I know the, the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to what, church? Plans to prosper you and not to harm you plans to give you what hope and a future and we love that verse and today I think we're going to see how powerful that verse is because a lot of times we do and I'll just we do proof texting you, you, you see churches will do proof text and they'll take out a verse and they'll take out this verse and they'll build some kind of storyline with it but but if you look at the context of the scripture this verse I think has a lot more power to it so that's what we're going to do today. We all have plans. We all do. Notice, though, that God does not say, for I know the plans you have for you. He doesn't say that. 
He says, I know the plans I've got for you. And I want you to notice in the Bible that God is always interrupting somebody's plans. Have you noticed that? God is always interrupting somebody's plans. I mean, you know, Noah didn't plan on building an ark. Abraham did not plan on birthing a nation in his 90s. Uh, Esther did not plan on stopping a genocide. Moses did not plan on leading millions of people through the desert. Mary did not plan on being pregnant as a virgin. No story, no single story in the Bible begins with some human being had a great plan. Because the Bible, just like life itself, it's not about your plans. So as we look at this, I want to give you some context as we head into Jeremiah 29. First, you need to understand this. Any nation at this time always thought that if they have a great God, then they'll be a great nation. So if you're a weak nation, that means you have a weak God. If you're a strong nation, that means you have a strong God. So Israel thought the plan was going to be, they were going to be the greatest nation in all the earth to validate God, Yahweh, and here's what happened. They entered the promised land. Remember, they leave Egypt, they go in the promised land. Things would be going pretty well, but then they kind of hit a rough patch with the judges. They get a king. The king doesn't work out very well, but they get a second king. His name's David, and he is amazing. This is when Bruce Springsteen sung about glory days, all right? This is the glory days of Israel. David, and then we get Solomon. Solomon was doing pretty good, but at the end of his days, I mean, things seem to be going up and to the right. I mean, that's how it looks like when you look at the history, but then also so you get to Solomon, and it looks like things are starting to go downhill. And because Solomon rebels, and what happens when he rebels is all of a sudden you have a civil war between the north and the southern kingdom. Sounds like our country. And the northern kingdom rebels from God. And then in 712, 712 BC, Assyria comes in and eradicates the northern tribe and ends up sending them off in exile. That leaves the southern kingdom. That's where we hear about Judah. We hear about Judah, that's that's like the remnant left of Israel. Well, they last until 586 BC. Because of their rebellion, they are then swooped in, another nation swoops in, eradicates them, destroys them, and sends off the best and the brightest to Babylon. And that is where we find ourselves right here in Jeremiah 29. There in Babylon, it's a foreign country, radically different gods, different lifestyle, different values. Nobody had planned this for Israel. And so when you're in these kind of plans, you're asking these kind of questions because your plans obviously are being changed. You're asking, who's our God? You've done this when your plans change. Is my God loving? Is my God powerful? Is my God good? Is it a myth? Is this a mistake? And that's exactly what the people in exile are asking about the true God, Yahweh. See, there's a great crisis, and when a great crisis hits, we ask ourselves this question, and that's what the people in Judah are asking. How can we proclaim that our God is good and our God is strong When my plans have been shattered, how can you proclaim that? And so all of a sudden, in the light of that, as these people are off in a different country, Jeremiah writes a letter from Jerusalem to the exiles in Babylon. And that's what you just read in Jeremiah 29. And so right here, you need to know that these people receiving this letter, they've got lots of questions. And one of the questions is this, how long are we going to be here? How long are we going to be in Babylon? When can we go back home? How long is this exile going to be? How do we relate to these Babylonians? Do we, do we engage with them? Do we stay away from them? What do we do? Lots of questions. In light of all those questions, Jeremiah writes what you're about to read. And when, what he writes is controversial. Here's what he says from the Lord God Almighty. Look what it says. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I, look at this, I carried. Notice this. Who do the, who do the people in exile think carried them off in exile? Who do they think? Babylon. But guess who carried them off in exile? God. God did it. Why? Because of their rebellion. I carried you, I carried you in the exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Here's what he says. Build houses and settle down. I want you to plant gardens. I want you to eat what they produce. I want you to build, settle, plant, 
eat. I want you to marry and have sons and daughters. I want you to find wives and, and, and for your sons. I want you to give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Here's what he says, church. He says, increase. Increase there. Do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and the prosperity of the city to which, once again, in case you haven't caught on yet, I have carried you. I have carried you in exile. While you're there, I want you to do something else. I want you to pray to the Lord for it. It. What's it? Because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is the Lord Almighty. This is the God of Israel talking to you. And those, those, those titles are not flippant. He's saying, I am still high on my throne. I'm still the Lord of lords. I'm still the King of kings. All right, things aren't going well for you. That doesn't change my status. I'm still over it all. And on top of that, I am your God, Israel. I know what you're going through. I'm with you. I'm personally, intimately connected to you. Says to Israel, he says, do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. Basically, he's saying, hey, don't listen to people who are telling you what you want to hear. Because here's what, here's what God says about those people. He says, they're prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Here's what he says. You want to know how long? Well, here it is. 70 years. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good purpose to bring you back to this place. And then we get to verse 11. For I know, God says, the plans I have for you declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Now you have to understand here that what Jeremiah is saying goes against what anybody else is saying. Because in exile, there's two theories on how the, uh, how the people of Israel should operate with the Babylonians. One theory is this, and that is, well, if you can't beat them, join them. If you can't beat them, join them. I mean, and that's exactly what Babylon wants. See, Babylon was gobbling up countries right and left. And I don't know if you know this, but countries kind of resent that kind of thing. Like, they don't like it when you, you know, just send them off and bring them and, and kick them out of their houses. And so people tend to rebel. So Babylon's strategy is this. Why don't we bring all these people to Babylon and they'll see our wealth, they'll see our splendor, they'll see our glory They'll see our ways. They'll take on our values. They'll take on our lifestyle. They'll worship our gods. Because if people can get assimilated to us, then they won't rebel anymore. The problem with that idea is that you lose your identity if you do that. The problem with that is you lose your purpose. You lose your relationship with God. The easy way will all of a sudden eradicate their identity. They'll lose everything if they choose that way. All right, so that's number one. If you can't beat them, join them. The second idea is this, and that is let's just isolate. All right? Let's just isolate from these Babylonians. And that was kind of the main thinking. It was a strong party that said, have, let's have nothing to do with the Babylonians. The, the, these false prophets were telling the, the people of, of Israel and Babylon, you're not going to be here very long. So just isolate. It, it, you have to wait a little longer, and then, and, then, and then you'll be back home. So to have nothing to do with these Babylonians. So it's interesting, in light of that, Jeremiah doesn't even speak to one of those two options. He says, here's what God is doing. He said, God is up to something here in exile. Here's what God wants you to do. Here's what he says. Build houses. I want you to settle down. I want you to plant. I want you to eat. I want you to marry in other words, you're going to be in exile for a long time. <laughs> you're going to be in exile for a long time. Don't listen to those other guys. Here's the truth. You're going to be here for a while. And God is saying, I want you, while you're there in Babylon, to permeate. I want you to permeate in which the world you find yourselves. I want you to be kind of a salt. I want you to be a light in a dark world. I want you to build. I want you to plant. I want you to marry. What's he saying? I want you to worship God in Babylon. 
Because when you build, what you do is you would have a blessing ceremony. You'd worship God when you build. When you, when you plant, you would give the first crops, first fruits to God. That's a form of worship. When you marry, you have a man and a woman, husband and wife there before God, and you would worship God again in that marriage ceremony. He's saying, you can worship me in Babylon. The point being is that the God of Israel is actually the God of Babylon. Babylon just doesn't know that yet. Babylon's plan was to assimilate Israel into their religion, but God's plan is to assimilate Babylon into God's kingdom. He said, I want you to live in Babylon with God because when you're with God in Babylon, when you're with God in exile, when you're with God in homesickness, it's not the same anymore. How many of you have been homesick? Raise your hand if you've ever been homesick. Raise your hand if you've ever been homesick, all right? One time I think about being homesick was when I went to Bible, Bible camp for the first time. By the way, Riley went to Bible camp, who was just baptized, and out of Bible camp, that's what prompted her to say, I'm ready to get baptized, all right? And that's it. So Bible camp's very, very crucial. I love it. I love that what our youth ministry does, our kids' ministry does. It's amazing. It changes lives. But when I went to Bible camp for the first time, I was just a young little lad, all right? I, had, I couldn't hear very well, by the way. I, I, 70% of my hearing was knocked out as a kid, and, and uh, my wife would say it's still the case, by the way, but 70% I couldn't hear, and so I had a lot of ear infections growing up. Went to Bible camp, had a tremendous bad ear infection there, and I remember could not wait to go home. Couldn't wait to go home. That was like my first time I've ever experienced homesickness. Well, I, I, I came back home, and I grew up, and, and all of a sudden you're 18, and it's time to leave home. Couldn't wait to leave home at that point. Which, by the way, I, I get kind of emotional thinking about several of our college students are about to leave home. My own daughter, first time ever, is about to leave off to college. So if I break up crying, if I just start bawling right in the middle of the sermon, you'll know what's going on. So just let's just keep moving forward, all right? But that, that happened to me. All of a sudden, it was my time to leave. And I remember going, I can't wait. Can't wait to go to college. Can't wait to do the next thing. And then I went off to school, and it was fun for a little while. But then the shine kind of wears off. And then you start realizing, you're like, this isn't really home. But then you would go back home, and you go back where you grew up, it's not home either because all my friends had left. And it's a weird place when you don't know where home is, if you've ever had that happen to you before. And that's what's going on with the, the Israelites. And, and, and my, my, my thinking, my heart, my soul changed when I started doing the live God experience, when I started realizing, going, God, it doesn't matter where I'm at, you're there. And when I started pouring myself into God, all of a sudden, I felt more at home with God. And here's the truth. One of the deepest lessons of exile is we can learn this, is to live the with God life in Babylon where things do not turn out the way we planned. Because things don't turn out the way we plan it here. Have you noticed that? And so what's going to make this better? You have to do it with God. And Jeremiah has already told the people, Hey, you're going to be in exile for a long time. And they don't like to hear that, by the way. And then he says this. He says, also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you. I carried you into exile. Pray, he says this, pray to the Lord for it because if it prospers, guess what happens? You too are going to prosper. Now, you picture this. There's a crowd of exiles gathered around the person who's reading this scroll from Jeremiah. And Jeremiah says, God says this, I want you to, to pray to, to the God of Israel for the city of Babylon. Pop quiz question here. Who is the country that destroyed their country and took them in exile? What country was that? It was Babylon. Babylon did that. So Jeremiah says, I want you to pray to God for these people who ruined your lives. Uh, not only that, I want you to devote your energies. I want you to develop your skills to bring peace to people who brought war to you. To bring prosperity to the city that brought devastation to your city. Now, this is a radical new way of being present in culture. And God is saying this, I don't want you to assimilate in the culture and be like them in every aspect. I don't want you taking on their morality or their sexual morality issues. I don't want you taking on their idolatries. I don't want you doing that. I also don't want you to isolate either. 
What I want you to do is I want you to be a salt. I want you to be a light. I want you to permeate that culture. I want you to pray for them. And then he says these striking words. Seek the peace and prosperity of the city because when the city prospers, you're going to prosper. Now this is very important because he is not, Jeremiah is not preaching a health and wealth gospel. The word translated peace in this passage is the word shalom. Shalom's kind of a big deal in the Old Testament. Shalom means this. Shalom means universal flourishing, universal wholeness. It means universal delight. Chuck Colson put it this way. He says shalom. Shalom is peace with God, peace with fellow man, and peace with creation. It's just universal flourishing, universal wholeness, universal delight. And God is saying, I want you to engage in work. I want you to engage in business. I want you to engage in arts and technology and the education system. I I want you to live with your neighbors in in ways that you represent me. I want you to handle your finances in such a way that the city in which you find yourself can flourish as God intends for a city to flourish. I want you to live depending on me in such a way that the Babylonians look at you and they say, you know, I don't believe what those God people believe, but I got to say, I'm, I'm glad they're here. Our city would be darker. Our city would be poor if it wasn't for the people of God. And God says, that's how I want you to live. That's how I want you to be present in your Babylon. In other words, we want to lead our generation into a transforming relationship with Jesus Christ in authentic community with each other so that Clay County, so that Northeast Florida, so that our Babylon can be blessed, can flourish as God intends for it to flourish. So what does this look like? It looks like my friend Terry Lane. Terry Lane ran a, a, a cabinetry business right next door to a place called Cleveland Arms. Now, if you know anything about Jacksonville, you know Cleveland Arms is one of the most violent places in our city. Tons of, tons of gang activity. And so he's got his cabinetry warehouse right there. And all of a sudden, he keeps getting broke into. They're breaking into his warehouse. And finally, because Terry's a, you know, a redneck, he, he, gets his, he gets his pickup truck and on the back and he, in his warehouse. And he sits there with his gun just waiting for somebody to show up. He's fuming mad. And he looks over across the fence and he sees kids playing some basketball inside Cleveland Arms. And he's watching them play basketball and then he got an idea. What if I um, bought some basketballs? What if I did that? So he went down to Walmart or whatever, got about five basketballs, and he filled them up and he wrote on there, you know, from, you know, such and such, uh, from his company and he said, from Terry Lane. And he threw the basketballs over the fence into Cleveland Arms. He comes back the next day, all the basketballs are gone. And so he goes and gets more basketballs. And he writes on them from his company and from him, puts Terry Lane on it. And then he throws the basketballs over the fence. Comes back the next day, all those basketballs are gone. Next thing you know it, these kids start coming up on his property. Just wanting to talk to him and thank him for all the basketballs. Next thing you know it, they're hanging out. And then they ask, hey, do you have anything to drink, mister? And next thing you know, he's like opening up his whole Coke machine. He's like handing out Mountain Dew and Sprite and Dr. Pepper. And these kids really love him now. And then, you're not going to believe it, he sells his company, ends up becoming a pastor, and now he's a pastor inside Cleveland Arms. And it all started because he put a gun down and he started buying some basketballs. And he found himself... From one side of the fence to the other side of the fence. And I'm telling you what, church, that's what it looks like when you are a person in exile wanting to make Babylon flourish. It's cool because when you live in exile, what you learn is that God cares about Israel, but God also cares about Babylon. God cares about Clay County, but guess what? He also cares about Cleveland Arms. 
God cares about every community. He cares about Orange Park and Fleming Island and Oak Leaf and Middleburg, Lake Asbury, Green Cove Springs. God cares about Keystone Heights. He cares about every neighborhood. He cares about every business. He cares about every school. He cares about every single home. He's concerned about little lives that get aborted and never get a chance to grow up. He cares about addicts. He cares about CEOs. He cares about CEOs who are addicts. And here's the thing. Most people who go to Babylon, when they go to Babylon, when they come to a city like America, they come because they want to take something from it. I go hiking a lot, and when I'm hiking Appalachians or, or up in the, in the Rocky Mountains, you'll go in and see these mines. I love walking in the mines. And one thing I've noticed about mines is that no one ever goes there and puts gold inside the mine, right? I've never seen people bring tons of gold and putting them inside the mine. What they do? They're going to look for gold to take it out of the mine. And that's what it is. People come to, come to Florida to get rich, to get tan, to get pleasure to take. People go to Green Cove Springs because they want the quiet and, and the laid back life. People go to Fleming Island because they want a nice suburban life. People go to Start because they get bad directions, all right? But anyway, God, God says, I want people who will go in Babylon, who will go into a city and actually think because they're with me, what can I give? Instead of what can I take? I want a people who will not change course because of Babylon, because of the culture. And we get so riled up about Babylon, don't we? We get so mad because their values are different than our values. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. We got a problem. And it's not Babylon. Our problem is our sin. My problem is my sin. I mean, I'll look at what John says. John says that if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. The biggest sin problem a church can have is when it does not admit, hey, you know, we got a sin problem. The real problem in exile is not when the church is in Babylon, it's when Babylon is inside the church. That's when it gets bad. And there's a guy I'm thinking of right here in our church, and he wrestles with sin. He wrestles with sin in his attitudes, sin in his behavior, that he, he tries to keep hidden from other people so he can look better than he really is and have a more spiritual reputation than he really deserves. And he wanted to remain anonymous, but I'm going to tell you who it is. You know who it is? It's me. It's me. And it's you too. We have a sin problem. You ever met someone who's all about self-promoting? You ever hung out with someone? It's, it's kind of odd. I was, I, was, I was with a group of people, and one, one guy's kind of self-promoting. I'm like, can everybody see what I'm seeing? <laughs> can everyone smell what I'm smelling? And I think they did, except, except him. And as I was driving away, I started thinking about this. I started thinking, man, how often is that true of me? And people who know me, they know it. They see the self-promotion. They see it, and they smell it. But I'm the one that doesn't. And here's the thing, church. A lot of times, if I do wrong, God knows and God sees everything. And what happens is when it changes me, when it changes me for the worse because of my sin and my ego and my, you know, Babylon's not as good as I am. I mean, I know more about Babylon. You know, all of a sudden, we get kind of this uppity, superior superiority complex we get really preoccupied because we're so self-righteous and here's the thing the gospel of grace what it does it eradicates all of that judgmentalism out of you it just evaporates out of you and you realize you know what i'm no different than anybody else i'm just forgiven <laughs> i mean I, I still struggle with sin but thank god because of the blood of jesus christ i am washed clean not because of my goodness but because of god's goodness through jesus christ amen it's not because of, of Nathan Freeman. It's only because of, of Jesus Christ. So I walk around a lot more humble in Babylon. And all of a sudden, it's not about, you know, how wonderful I am. It's all about how wonderful God is. And it's through the gospel of grace that we grow towards maturity in Christ by learning and belonging and healing and serving together. That we pray for and we seek the peace and the prosperity, the shalom, the flourishing to our little world, our Clay County, our Babylon. Now, where does this happen? Where does the shalom happen at? It happens wherever you go. 
happens wherever you go. I've said the Halverson benediction so much to you that you got to start quoting it back to me. And here it is again. I want you to look at this, and I want you to just let it drill in your heart. Here's the truth, church. Where you are going, guess what? God is sending you. Where you are now, God has placed you. God has a purpose for your life right where you are. Christ Jesus, who in, he's inside of you, he indwells you, has something that he wants to do in you and through you, so right where you are right now. What does that look like? That looks like when you see a stressed out young mom, you go in and you help her out, a little shalom breaks out. It looks like when you pray before you go to work, God be with my attitude today before I go into work, a little shalom breaks out. It, it looks like this, that instead of you gossiping behind somebody's back, you go and you talk to them and have a coffee together. Together and work that out as brothers and sisters ought to work it out. A little shalom breaks out. You know, when you are nice to a clerk or when you're there to volunteer to an overworked teacher, a little shalom breaks out. When you pray with a wounded veteran, a little shalom breaks out. And then we become a Jeremiah 29 kind of church. Shalom starts impacting and breaking out all over our community. And when it's hard, and when you get hit, and when you, get, when you suffer, and when you get disappointed, don't be surprised. Welcome to Babylon. Welcome to Babylon. And maybe what I should seek is not for God to get me out of exile. Maybe what I should seek is to see God in exile. Maybe what I should seek is not for God to get me out of here, but rather for me to seek God in my exile. And it was an exile that Israel realized this. They realized, you know, our dream, our plan is not really apparently God's plan. Apparently God has something else, how he wants to use us. And it was only in exile that Israel realized maybe God wants to use us to redeem the whole world in a whole way we did not expect. In exile, the Israelites were spread all over the known world. And wherever they went, they would form these little communities, these little synagogues. And years later, they became receptors for this other man who knew something about exile. His name was Paul. And Paul would come to these synagogues who were spread all over the known world and talk to a man who knew something else about exile. His name was Jesus. And he would share Jesus with these people. And, and Jesus, a guy who kind of did a voluntary exile when he left heaven and came down to earth. And Jesus says these words. He says, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has, look at this, has no place to lay his head. Jesus was in exile every step of the way. His ministry was in exile. And all of a sudden, one day, he takes steps to carry a cross outside the gate of Jerusalem. Because crucifixion by law could not happen inside the gates of Jerusalem. And it communicated to everyone else that the person being crucified was in exile. The person being crucified, the dying, the person being crucified was going to be rejected. And then we see this heartbreaking passage in Hebrews chapter 13 when it says, and so Jesus also, look at this, he also suffered where? Outside. That is not a, 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 an accidental phrase. That is totally purposeful. He's saying that he was hated. He was detested. He was mocked to make the people holy through his own blood. And one last final step of exile, Jesus says these words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he's in complete exile, and he dies, and all his followers' dreams die with him. And out of the ashes of that dead dream of resurrection gospel emerges in his birth, and it's the reconciled for sinners like you and me back to God. That was God's plan the whole time. And you and I, we live in exile. And so we have to die to our own self-preoccupied dreams and plans because part of God's greater glorious plan is this, to redeem the whole world. God says this over you, and here it is. He says, I know the plans I have for you. Not what you have for you, what I have for you. And I know there's many of you in the room where you've had a death of a dream. And let me tell you right now, when there's a death of a dream, you feel like you're dying. And I totally get it. The reason why I'm here standing before you is, is because of a death of a dream. 
I was in Arizona. Things were going great with ministry. And, and um, I'll be honest, I wanted to die in the desert. <laughs> Everything was going great. And then our family suffered a great loss. And out of that great loss, a lot of mourning, mourning for the person we lost, but also the mourning of a death of a dream. And in mourning for that over a year, all of a sudden God told me it's time to act. I've got different plans for you. And all of a sudden it led me to talk to 80 people who are meeting in a funeral home out in Nowhereville, Clay County, Florida. And all of a sudden here we are. God's dreams, God's plan was way bigger than my dreams and my plan. And I praise him for that. I'm telling you right now, church, our Heavenly Father, He knows about your hopes. He knows about your discouragements. He knows about the exiles of every person in this room and every person right now online. And, and, and it might be something physical, financial. It might be something relational. It might be a divorce. It might be rejection. It might be isolation. It, it might be a failure, depression. Some, sometimes things seem to be humming, but you know in life, not all our plans are going to work out. So in that, I'm asking you right now, Here's what we need to do. We need to acknowledge that right now our plans are not the ultimate plans. Amen? Will you stand with me? Everybody stand with me, all right? I want us to say this with conviction. I want us to say this statement right here with conviction. You guys online can join us. And let's say this statement right here. One, two, three. We need to acknowledge that our plans are not the ultimate plans. Say it again with me. We need to acknowledge that our plans are not the ultimate plans. And we only see a little bit, right? We only see a little bit. Sometimes we cling so hard to our dreams that if they die, we feel like we're going to die. Would you allow God to speak these words over you? For I know the plans I have for you, church. They're not your plans. They're not easy plans. They're surely not pain-free plans. But I, I've got some plans for you. Would you accept his plans? Would you accept his truth? As we close, I want you to close your eyes. I want you to hold your hands out. And I want you to receive a blessing right now that I want to say over you. So if you close your eyes, just receive this blessing. Hold your hands out. You guys online, here it is. I'm going to say this over you. Those in exile in Babylon, I want to say over you right now, go in peace and bless the world. And remember, you go nowhere by accident. Where you're going, God is sending you. And where you are, he has placed you there. God has a purpose for your life right where you are. Christ Jesus, who indwells inside of you, has something that he wants to do in you and through you right where you are. So believe this. Believe it. And go in his love. Go in his grace. And go in his power. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the whole church said, amen. I hope you know. God's got some big plans for you. And maybe today you need, you need to accept his plan for your life. You haven't done that, let us know. Fill out that card. You guys online can let us know by the request prayer button. You can QR code that thing that's right there in front of you, that, that card. Let us know if you want to give yourself the ultimate plan, and that is receiving Jesus Christ, just like Riley did. Let us know in this song. You can go to the left or go to the right during communion. I mean, during our time, go to the crosses during this time of worship. And right now, I'm just going to encourage you right now to submit, to surrender your plans to him. And there you'll find hope. Let's sing about it right now. Let's give him the glory.